So Preston, I don't know if you know this. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. We just passed the 10 year anniversary of Dance with Dragons. Yeah. It's been 10 years. 10 years. I can't believe it. I I still remember back when season five and six were, were really coming out. I'm like, he's probably going to release it around season six because, you know, it'll, it'll coincide. The sixth book, sixth season. And no, no, no. Oh, it's going to happen. Season seven. Nope. Season eight. This is it. This is the end of the show. Perfect way to segue in the sixth book. Nothing. Two years later, nothing. Here we are. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's pretty tough. It's pretty rough, considering that I think I think I've done the the math that he only needed to write 120 words a day to 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 to, to reach what um to have, so the yeah so Winds of Winter has I think forty four hundred and forty thousand words, and so if you divide that by three hundred and sixty three thousand six hundred and fifty. 2.5 you know in 10 years there's there's 3652.5 days you would get 120.5 words as as it, what what he would need to write to have the winds of winter out today 120 words which is not much <laughs> for a professional writer it's it's what 120 words is is one fifth of a page mm -hmm. for a professional writer you know that that should be doable, but it you know. Nope. Well, s someone was telling me how they feel as though, and I've I've seen people in the comment section say this all the time. They feel as though George is more interested in world building than he is in like finishing the story, which I kind of understand that. I mean, that, that would make sense. Not to mention, we also had a video we did a while ago where we were making the joke of how George R. R. Martin is just so busy running Hollywood because he has all these projects coming out at the same time. Yeah. You know. Um, we got confirmation about his involvement in the Elden Ring video game where he was supposed to write a couple things for it. He finished his involvement apparently like years ago. So, um, yeah, I, I, after the death of Kentaro Miura, who wrote yeah. Zerk, I, I'm getting nervous. I'm getting well, a little nervous. Yeah, of course. I mean, he's never going to finish, but, but the question is whether we're, if we're going to get winds of winter, I mean, let's keep in mind that, that, He's not that practiced in finishing novels. Like he doesn't have that many novels with endings. Um, he was a short story writer for a number of years, you know, and then, you know, he wrote episodes and for, for, you know, the Twilight Zone and, and, and Beauty and the Beast and things like that. Um, you know, something as mammoth as this, you know, he, it, it got away from him. He keeps, he keeps kicking it down the, like I say, kick the can down the road, procrastinate. Uh, yeah, it's tough. We, 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 you know, we, everybody's had bouts of procrastination and it's tough, but I, I don't know how, I don't know how someone, when it's, it's your job. Um, I find it funny that he's struggling to finish Winds of Winter now that he's found success, but way back when, when he was a starving artist, when he was struggling, yeah. he would have finished it like that. It wouldn't, wouldn't even been a topic to debate. Winds of Winter would have been out oh, 2014, sure. 2015 he, 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 tops. He once wrote a story in one day that's not bad called The Runners. It's funny. Yeah. If he didn't have all these distractions, it's really rough. I, it's hard for me to, to even conceptualize the level of procrastination and what it would do to a human being. Like, I feel bad when I procrastinate a video or I procrastinate writing. There's a lot of things in my life where I'm just like, oh, I've put, I've put that off, you know? Like, mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a book that's like nine-tenths done and I just can't finish the last thing. But, you know, I have a lot of excuses, okay? <laughs> like, I have a full-time job. I have a child. Like, those take a lot of time, a lot of time, where I have just a little time in the day to do things. You know, and so when it's your when it's your job, like I couldn't imagine work telling me, OK, you have one month to write something and I come back 10 months later and w with the result, like I would be fired, like would, I'd be a laughing stock. Like what? You were supposed to have this in one month and it took you 10 months. Like, I'm sorry. Like. This is your job. We, 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 we pay you money for this, right? Like from a publishing point of view, you give somebody a deadline. You're like, okay, we gave you this advance. I understand. Like 
We're going to have this deal, this contract on, on having this book. We're going to make a lot of money together. Oh yeah, I'll have it done. Well, in a year. What are they going to do? They're going to risk. They're going to what? Fire him? Not work with it anymore? That's money down the drain. Well, uh, obviously, right? Right. They I just mentioned keep... Berserk earlier. The the guy would always go on hiatus, and yeah. he would come like for years at a time, and then he would come back and you know put all that chapter, and they'd be like, okay, thanks. You know, but he would produce. He was, he would produce some. They were they they weren't going to fire the, the people who uh, who published Berserk. They weren't going to fire uh, Mura. So. I mean, well, yeah. now that there's the 10th anniversary, uh, it came in, it came and went. Um, I still wanted to ask you, what are some of your favorite Dance of Dragon chapter or chapters? I, uh, my favorite is it's definitely the last Theon chapter. The last Theon chapter where yeah. he is that, is that the one where he escapes Winterfell yeah, the, or the he... one the one where he escapes? Like I still remember reading that for the first time and being on the edge of my seat and being like, oh my god, like what's gonna happen? Like I think it was just really well paced. I was I was more invested in that story, and I still remember myself years ago when I read it. Like, oh my god, what's going to happen? Oh, I have to finish this. How often does a book really like pull you in like that? You know, mm -hmm. where you just you have to keep reading because you have to fit like, because there's such a build up. And I just remember like just going through the other chapters quickly and 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 trying to get to to um to theon again i think over time re like rereading and everything my opinions probably changed on which one like i like the most i i think maybe i like the, the the asha chapters more like i didn't care for them too much my first read and then i kind of appreciate them later on mm -hmm. um but even that back and forth like the pulse and and, and the pacing of of those two stories coming to meet each other theon and asha like I, I think that's the best part of, of the book. And, and I can't think of anything else that, that I liked as much. I mean, I like the Quentin chapters quite a bit. Like I wanted to know what happened to Quentin and, and, and his, um, his scheme to, to, to steal a dragon. I'm trying to think of any, any other chapters. I can give you my favorite. Okay. What's your favorite? Uh, Davos with, uh, mm. Wint Manderley, the North remembers. Hmm. hmm which one, yeah. which, what is that? That is that like, what is it? Davos? Davos, Davos four. Yeah, I think so. I like. I really like that one. The Dragon Tamer one was pretty good too. Yeah, Cersei's Walk of Atonement. I think that's what Cersei, uh, three, two, something like that. Yeah, um, that one was pretty good as well. I think I, I appreciate I appreciate the John Con chapters a lot more now. Like my first read through, I hated the John Con chapters because you're like, who the hell is this person? Like I have no connection to them. But now, like now reading them, I, I think they're they're much better than I thought the first time through. Like they grow on you. But uh, Quentin's 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 a great story. I think Quentin's great. I think the Theon Theon. I mean, the Theon's the best. I, I loved it the first time through. I think it's still the best. I think the Asha chapters are really good. I think I think Quentin is really good. I think the bottom of the bucket. I think the John, Danny, and Tyrion chapters are not good <laughs> really you don't like the john uh, john's final chapter where he john's you know, final gets... chapter is okay but he's just it just feels like it's killing time it just feels like killing time for the most part yeah, yeah. um the danny chapters mm, I, I was never interested i was never that interested in the marine stuff and Tyrion spends what most of dance of dragons is traversing through ss yeah yeah eh. i i understand what you mean westeros is where it's at Westeros is is really weird. Like even Victarion was more interesting for me at least than and then um than a lot of the 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 John stuff. Yeah, and I, and I, and I'm trying to think like why those ones did not work and why why I say Asha, Theon and Quentin are so good. And I think it's because you have this ending that that everything is building towards and it's a big ending you're like oh my god something has to break like there has to be this battle between St like stannis is gonna arrive like what's gonna happen when stannis arrives like and this battle like it's everything's building towards that and it's such it's such there's such tension building towards this um it's the same with quentin like everything is building towards that dragon and uh with Tyrion, there's some building in the sense that oh he's heading towards danny but he's so far from Danny for most of the time. And then when he finally gets to Slaver's Bay, you know, he's stuck in these camps and you don't, 
in the in the in the cell sword camps and you, you don't feel like he's or he's progressing actually, yeah so i mean i guess he's not he's he's in the cell swords at the very end but he's he's with the um with gezin um, you know what's you know what's you know what it reminds me of it's it's like the 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 chapter equivalent of ari in the house of black and white washing the bodies like yeah. you, you know what she's doing is kind of important but this part right here is just we don't want to we want to see the we want to see her like actually doing the stuff not doing this right you don't i need mean to see this what what those failed at the reason those failed is is that there is a mystery of what the house of black and white is and so it has to be an onion that you're that you peel for it to be interesting it has to be an onion that you're peeling that you get more and more of the mystery the book does a better job you find a little bit more about the house of black and white you know as time goes on but in the show we didn't learn anything about the house of black and white like nothing it's just she washed some bodies and and then it was that was it like and she had a training montage right we didn't learn anything about how they do like what they believe because they they seem to contradict themselves in the in the show um you know how they how they pull these things off the relationship how how it functions none of it like what what their big plan was we learned nothing we learned nothing and so that's why it really failed in the show at least in the book there's this like peeling of the onion and and her gaining more power that drives the plot but you need to have you need to have something that everything is marching towards right you need the plot needs to march towards something and the problem with john and danny is it wasn't like danny's plot marches towards her wedding with his dar which is not really that eventful you know like okay she get she gets married to this kind of nice guy <laughs> you know who's trying to bring peace to the city and john like it's marching towards hmm what you know like i guess it eventually gets to wildlings coming to the wall like to make peace like that's that's not it's not compelling enough it's not like in a storm of swords where he's waiting for a freaking battle the wildlings are coming to the wall to attack you know like that's something that's coming yeah it's just it's not it's just it's just meandering so yeah that's kind of that kind of fails really fails. well a lot of them just focus on setting the stage for what's to come yeah even the jamie chapter i don't think advance the plot very much the cersei Doesn't chapters, jamie have one chapter he has one chapter where he shows up at penny tree nothing much uh, this, even the Cersei chapters, she doesn't get she doesn't really get out of her situation. I mean, she does the walk of shame, which is weird and interesting, but it doesn't re it doesn't get her. It doesn't change her status of power too much. Like we, you know, she, she's still kind of toothless. She hasn't she hasn't regained her power yet. So that I, you don't you don't feel something compelling. Even like even in Feast for Crows, the Cersei story is marching towards something, you know? Like you feel things getting worse and everything falling apart. And Cersei has a plan to frame Marjorie. And as things go on, that plan falls apart and it culminates with a big arrest, right? And so like that Feast for Crows story is is pretty good. And then it, she just kind of festers in jail for two chapters. Um, yeah, she gets out of jail in the end, but She's still... You can definitely tell it was initially planned to be like one giant book until he split it up into two. You can definitely tell. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, but I do like how like all the major characters that have been incredibly interesting and have had interesting journeys throughout the first three books, the the, the star really shines on the secondary ones like Victarion and Davos and Quentin. Mm -hmm. I mean, a friend a friend of mine once said that that a feast for crows and a dance with dragons are are people you don't care about doing interesting things and people you care about doing nothing. Rereading the Brienne story, like now, you know, now I've really come around to the Brienne story being like a really great story. But I realized though, reading first, like, why should we care about Brienne? Brienne was this, uh, this, my, this other character. Like, why should I care? And it's like, well, she is doing some really interesting things. Or Victarion, who has the most interesting plot, <laughs> you know, like, who is this guy? No one, no one, no one. Or, I mean, Aaron and Victarion are, are just massively interesting plots. But at the same time, it's like, who cares about these dudes? Like, they're not who we've been reading about for, for how many books and how many years. I mean, now I care about them because we've been rereading the books for 10 years. But like, 
yeah, it's just Quentin has, you know, some new character gets the most exciting plot. You know, John Con is starting a war, you know, but what is what is Tyrion doing? He's sitting on some boats. John is John is worrying about foodstuffs and, and where and and how he's gonna feed a giant, you know. Danny is worrying about you know off-screen terrorist attacks, where one, two, maybe six people die at a time. Like it's a lot different than a huge battle, isn't it? <laughs> you know. Well, before we wrap things up, you found some uh, weird uh, text from the books that you wanted to uh, go into. Please, by all means, I I'm actually very curious. Well, I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of mistakes um, in in the series, and like some of them, some things like people theorize about whether or not they're mistakes intentionally, and they actually mean something else, or if or if um, the author just made an error, and so. Sometimes it's tough uh, to to figure out which is which. Like some mistakes that you might notice is like in A Dance with Dragons, when when Theon is at Winterfell with Bruce Bolton and Ramsay, and all the Freys and the Boltons are there, a stable collapses, and they end up bringing all of the horses into the Great Hall because they don't they no longer have a stable, and it's like actually that would be impossible because there's like <laughs> thousands, there's there's literally like a thousand horses. Um, like the phrase alone had like 500 horses and they're like less than, you know, they're like a third of the forces there. There should be like 1500 horses and there's no way they could fit into the wedding hall, which fits 500 people, you know, but like, and so, so something like that, you're just like, well, that's, that's just the author made a mistake. He, he wasn't calculating that kind of thing. But then there's this other weird stuff. And this one, this one, um, you're, you're going to be amazed that this line is even here. So this is from A Feast for Crows. Uh, Sam, you know, is on the boat and he's he's sailing down to Old Town with uh, baby Eamon, um, who is Mance Raider and Dalla's son, because there's been a there's been a swap and Gilly's baby has has been is, is at the wall. And at some point, um, Sam thinks the boy was Mance Raider's son and Craster's grandson after all. He had none of Sam's craven blood. And so, yeah, we all accept that it's Mance Raider's son, but the weird thing is he calls him Craster's grandson, which is completely new information, if, if that's the case. You know, like, how on earth would Aemon, baby Aemon be Craster's grandson? And figuring figuring the puzzle out is 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 really odd. And so, it's so, you know, is Dala like actually Gilly's sister? <laughs> you know, like it, I always thought he meant it in like a metaphorical way because that's the only way that really makes any sense. So there's a couple things wrong with the idea that it's it's metaphorical. So one, he's he's literally saying that this baby has none of Sam's craven blood in it, meaning he understands that. We're talking about his genetics. We're talking about like, you know, the 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 actual blood parents and, and lineage at this point that, that go into the child. So he wouldn't say like, oh, he's Craster's grandson, you know, metaphorically, because he's because he's adopted by Gilly, because he's also adopted by Sam. So like if if that could be part of his what what makes him up like he wouldn't he wouldn't talk about him that way because he's trying to say that this baby will not have craven blood so he's he's literally talking about the genetics of the baby in that sense oh and then the second thing is it's not Craster's he's not just Cra like Gilly's baby isn't just Craster's grandson it's Craster's son so why wouldn't he say the boy was Mance Raider's son and Craster's son after all he had none of Sam's craven blood like why would he jump to grandson well, if it's not a metaphor, which I'm still leaning towards, um, then it could be that maybe God Emperor George made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, since Gilly is the milk mother at this point, you could make the silly argument that C Craster would be the milk grandfather, as as ridiculous as that sounds. Yeah, I mean, okay. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, it, if that were a thing, I could see that. I mean, you're right that that he wouldn't be... In the, in the milk sense, in the milk mother sense, he wouldn't be, he would have no relation on a father's way. 
less milk mother. I mean, milk stepfather, milk because <laughs> he's because because he's kind of sort of married to Gilly, right? Grand. It's so odd. It's so odd. But so then the the idea is okay. Let's let's go through it like literally. Like maybe Dala is actually one of Craster's daughters. And Mance stole her from Craster. Like, is that a possibility? Okay. But right, but but that's never been brought up anywhere else. It's really odd. She doesn't she doesn't supposedly look like Gilly or anybody else, and all of the women look the same. Um, and then there's the question, like, okay, at some point Val, who is supposed to be sister to to Dala, would that mean Val is is also Craster's daughter because <laughs> that's never mentioned. And then at some point when they're talking about monster, I think Val says the baby is no kin to me. If it was his, her dad, like he'd literally be kin. And so Gilly would be her sister. And so monster would be her nephew. So like he would absolutely be kin. <laughs> Unless she's talking I, metaphorically, I, I right? It was metaphorical originally, yeah. <laughs> so it's this really complicated thing. I'm like, what the hell? What the hell is Sam thinking? And like, why did why did George R. R. Martin write this? Was he just having a brain fart? He's allowed a couple every now and then. But you had more, <laughs> by the way, yeah. Oh, well, that's that's one. Um, so let's see. There, there's. There's some, I've, I've talked to you in the past about uh, Jingle Bell and like the error from A Clash of Kings. Remind me, I, I don't remember this conversation. So Big Walder, the, the, one of the Frey boys that, that is a ward at Winterfell. There's Big Walder and Little, mm. Little Walder. So they're, they're both, Big Walder especially, but they're both always talk about Frey succession. And at some point... He mentions that uh, he go he starts going through the succession, and he actually says like, "Who will get the who will inherit the f the, the twins?" Weirdly, Big Walder passes over all of the women in in the uh, in the line, and so people start wondering about if the phrase you use different um, succession pattern than everybody else. Like they use ca agnatic, ca you know, cognac. Whatever you people that play Crusader Kings like <laughs> all know the terms because you have to like put it in, but it's the it's the it's the there's a succession uh, that that the Targaryens are under where you pass over all women in in, in uh, unless all of the men are exhausted then you go to the women, but so Big Walder weirdly passes over all the women and so a lot of people wonder about whether Frey succession includes women or not, um, and so we just don't know at this point because. Big Walder then goes on to say that Aegon, who is Jingle Bell, and his children will, you know, inherit after, you know, after Peter Pimple and and uh, and and Black Walder and and things like that. And but of course, like Jingle Bell is, you know, a, a, a mentally challenged individual. He's he's not married. They 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 lock him away at the at the at the twins. Like he doesn't have any children at least none listed in any appendix that we know about uh they would have to be true born anyway so it's weird that that big walder who is a inheritance expert would even like bring this guy bring this up so of course again and then in a storm of swords we jingle bells introduced as 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 mentally challenged and having no children and being unmarried so it's just you know it's just a mistake that that our author made i mean unless or big walder is actually really stupid which goes against everything else we've like seen with the boy. <laughs> I mean, he's supposedly obsessed with with succession. He 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 should know, you know, whether or not his uncle has children. <laughs> they all live at the twins together. It's funny that you you've noticed a lot of this stuff. I I guess that comes with the territory for reading like the books. How many times each? Like three, four times each. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I did a whole fray video, so it's That's like right. I real I really know the phrase, so it's like unfortunately. <laughs>
the only that, mistakes I've ever really um because when you're reading the books, you don't really like you're so engrossed, you don't really notice that stuff until someone points them out. Like um I remember the infamous one where someone got on George R. R. Martin's case for forgetting certain characters' eye colors. Yeah. And then yeah. he like changes it in the next book. Like sometimes it's blue, sometimes it's green. Yeah, it was Which Ren- character was that? Was it that was Ren- Renly, Renly, Renly's eye color. Like he he eventually made it so that all the Baratheons have you know vivid blue eyes, but he has Renly have green eyes um, on occasion, and he claims it. And then he he claims, oh, it's 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 what he wears. I did see George talk at a at a at a con about how, you know, he doesn't know why he does eye color, um, considering that like. People don't notice eye color that much Un- unless it's like unless they have like really vivid eyes. You don't really think about people's eye color. Like it's not, you know, somebody across the room. You're not going to be like, oh, look at those brown eyes like or their hazel eyes. You just it's not it's not a feature you actually like go to. So when he does a description of people walking in the room and having a certain eye color, it's kind of ridiculous. Like no one is sitting there noticing people's eye colors. But he writes that way and he understands he writes that way even though he understands that that's not how the real world works you know but yeah that's the that's the that's one that but there's i mean there's so many that people could that people could latch on to there's so many little mistakes um when davos goes to talk to wyman manderley he talks about how he needs to go to winterfell to go to the wedding but in fact, the wedding was supposed to be at was not was supposed to be at Barriton originally, and it gets moved to Winterfall, Winterfell, and so he would he should have said that I I need to go to Barriton, but he says I need to go to Winterfell, and so timing wise it just wouldn't work out. You know, there's 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 a lot of things like that um, that are just like there's there's no there's no explanation for it because the. It was it it was it was a decision made kind of spontane uh, spontaneously by Roose Bolton that they need to have it at Winterfell because um, Stannis is marching, you know. So, um, Lucky yeah, that good catches. Like holy shit, you you really like go through this with a fine tooth comb. <laughs> you really do. I mean, there's a few of them. Uh, in one of the letters, like Lord Dustin signs it, even though there's like. It's very important that there's no Lord Dustin, that there's only there's only Lady Dustin. Like a whole thing about her character is the fact that she's a widow and she's very angry at the Starks, mm-hmm. and so like Lord Dustin like being signed is just a mistake. It should have been Lady, you know. There's a lot of it's a lot of little little mistakes like that, but you know. The deadline is passed, man. The deadline is passed. Um, I don't know if anyone has taken George up on his word and actually locked him up in a. Uh a secure location to uh ensure that he finishes but um yeah it's uh it's not looking good no no but i don't know i mean all this time we 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 find all of his mistakes and then they could they could change them later Uh, you know they did change um i i think in future editions of a feast for crows they changed jane westerling's appearance because what do you mean because of the hip thing so if you if you read um, when Catelyn meets Jane Westerling in A Storm of Swords, she makes a big deal about Jane Westerling's hips being like wide and good for birthing children. Like it's like a very it's like she she kind of goes on about it for for a bit actually. Um, let me let me let me find the the actual quote here. The girls did seem to have good heart, just as Rob had said, and good hips which might be important. And then later she says, she, she starts later. She starts talking about how Cray calls also have wide hips to bear big children and how Edmure's child, uh, Edmure's wife of Frey is, is, has narrow hips. Like she talks about hips just a lot, like in a storm of swords. I think she mentions, um, she mentions uh, Jane Westerling's hips twice. And then she talks about Krakal hips, and then she talks about like Edmure's uh, uh, hip, uh, Edmure's wife's hips, Rosamund Frey's hips. And so you're like, okay, really weirdly, Catalan like hips were brought up like all over the place in the Storm of Swords. And then you get to a feast for crows, and Jay, uh, Jamie meets Jane Westerling, Jane, Jane Westerling, and he specifically like 
describes her as having as being skinny narrow and having narrow hips like he specifically is like oh jane is a willowy girl no more than 15 or 16 more awkward than graceful she had narrow hips breasts the size of apples a mop of chestnut curls Catalan goes on and on about the hips and then jamie meets the, the the same character and she has narrow hips and um and so a lot of people, me included, when we, you know, we thought there was something to this, like, oh my gosh, like this Jane Westerling is an imposter. Like the one that's been present- presented that, to that's Jane. That's what you guys thought when you heard this? Imposter immediately? Oh, yeah. I mean, I wasn't the first one to, to find it. Like, but when, when, when it was pointed out, because people were talking about it in, in boards, like, and then, you know, going through it now, like if you, if you read just the Catalan chapters in, in A Storm of Swords, it's really hard to miss it. You know, like the hips and then and then for Jamie to meet the character and be like, oh, she has narrow hips like, oh, man, because it's such an important plot point, whether or not she's pregnant and whether Rob has an heir like that is a really important plot point. Some fans, including me, like really thought there was something there that the real Jane Westerling had escaped with the blackfish or something. And, you know, who knows? But uh, no. Like George, like had to admit, like no, it was just a mistake. Like the hip thing is just a mistake, and I think it's been corrected in in um, future editions of the book. I mean, they have to be like brought up enough before he he has to like tell people to go to go make the correction, right? The the mistake in Clash of Kings has been there for for since 1998. No one's no one's changed that one. Like with 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 Jingle Bell, like the the Jingle Bell mistake has been in there. And, you know, he hasn't changed that one. But the hip one, people kept, I think people brought it up at a con or something. And he got, he had to say, oh, no. People no, are no. bringing this up at cons. You, you finally get a chance to talk to the big man himself. And that's what you bring up? Well, I mean, it'd be, it'd be a pretty big implicate, like pretty big uh, result if. I guess, but. If Jane that's... Westerling were an imposter. Yeah, yeah. But to go off on that, mm. <laughs> There's a guy I know who swears up and down that it's going to be announced in August. I, I mean, what, along with, uh, like, you know, what, the, the, the storm? Is the storm coming at that point, too? Like, what? This My, my pillow guy got to has some, has know something that the rest of us don't? <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's what this guy I know swears up and down that, that it's, it's, just, it's going to be announced in August. It's going to happen. And he swears up and down, like he he's he's just sure of it. I I don't know, man. Look, look I've been saying I, I'd this be for I'd years. be happy, I'd be happy, but but come on, you know how many times have we been through this? How many times? <laughs> I was so sure season six that was it, or at the end of season five that was it. So sure, and I've been saying this every yeah. single time yeah. ever since. I, I only stopped after Game of Thrones ended. I'm like, now nah, I don't know. 2022. Season one of House of Dragon. When Dance came out, I remember talking to somebody about it and somebody saying, oh, you know, they're pretty sure he can come. He can like produce the uh, produce the, the next book before season seven or something. But like after that, then that's the problem. Of course, none of that. The, the problem was was wins the whole time. <laughs> oh, well, do you have any more errors in the text? Uh, I mean, I have, it depends if you, I mean, I've got lots. It depends if you think they're interesting. I mean, a lot of these are, a lot of these are minor, but like for, uh, but, or could have big implications. Like there, there's some disagreement in the text about the, the Risewells at Winterfell, if they're brothers or if they're cousins, um, which kind of affects things. Cause Lady Dustin is a widow but she was originally a Risewell, which means like one of them could be inheriting Baratin, but um, it kind of makes a difference about how they act and how they treat each other if they're cousins versus siblings. So it's it's tough to say. I mean, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of little things like that. I don't know. I don't know how, how interesting they are. They're not as interesting as like the Craster thing, you know, or, or which... You know, there's still this some weird hope that twisting logic around that that somehow Eamon could be 
Mance's son and Craster's grandson, maybe. I don't think there's much hope that Big Walder's like talk about Jingle Bell is accurate. It just can't be. Like that's just that's just a mistake, you know. Yeah, or like you, there's no way you could make Manderley's discussion about needing to go to the wedding at Winterfell work. Like it just doesn't doesn't make any sense. It's just the the timing of all the chapters is really complicated. So um, it's very understandable, like that this mistake would would happen. It's even thinking about these chapters in order and which ones happened first is is hard to. And the causation of events is actually very difficult to, to conceptualize. And so clearly our author was, was confused as well.